All right, well, I think we'll get started here. Thank you for joining us. Tonight we have a program from the Office of Alumni and Alumni Relations, so thank you. We are here tonight for Amended, Untold Stories from the Women's Suffrage Movement. We're here tonight with Associate Professor Laura Free and audio producer Reva Goldberg. And I've also reached out to my new friend, Janine Waller, who will be moderating our event tonight. Janine Waller graduated from William Smith in 1999 with a BA in Comparative Lit. She is currently the Chief of Interpretation and Education at the Women's Rights in Harriet Tubman National Historic Park in Seneca Falls. She began her career with the National Park Service after serving in the Peace Corps in Mozambique from 2003 to 2005. She was an English language teacher and an AIDS educator. Janine has worked at Isle Royale National Park, Yosemite National Park, and has spent 13 years in Yellowstone National Park before returning back here to her home in the Finger Lake. So welcome, and Janine, I'll turn the program over to you. Thanks, Teresa. I'm so excited to be here. This is really cool. I see a lot of faces I haven't seen in a while. It was really fun. Um, one of the best parts about my job for the Park Service has always been the opportunity to talk to people who are incredibly knowledgeable and passionate about their work. It really brings the, the topics that we talk about in the Park Service alive. And my, uh, my first introduction to Dr. Free was exactly that. It was when I first started working here at Women's Rights about a year ago. And I'm super excited to, to be talking with her today. Um, as a historian of voting rights, Dr. Free uses the power of her pen and her voice to confront suffrage history with honesty. Through Amended, she is committed to creating a platform for stories that were ignored or erased by typical suffrage histories, uh, some of which we, we have been working on at Women's Rights as well. When she's not working on Amended, Dr. Free is Associate Professor of History at Hobart and William Smith Colleges, a member of the New York State Women's Suffrage Commission, and an author. Her most recent book is Suffrage Reconstructed, Gender, Race, and Voting Rights in the Civil War Era. And with her is her uh, partner in crime and partner in production, Reva Goldberg. Um, I just got to know Reva and, and I'm already really excited to hear about her uh, work on this process for Humanities New York in this podcast. Reva is an audio producer and content strategist with a passion for vital and creative nonfiction storytelling. In addition to the Women's History Podcast Amended, Reva has produced for the Climate Justice Podcast's Mother of Invention and The Overstory, and the weekly chat show Listed for Forbes. Before becoming a freelance audio maker, Reva was an independent film and documentary producer for many years, and she was also a longtime staff member at the nonprofit film foundation and production company Cinereach. We're going to start today with a clip of Amended to give you guys a little bit of a taste. We're going to turn it over to Reva so that she can handle the, the tech aspects that she does so well. No, okay, not yet. Not yet. How about Got now? It. There you go. Okay, here, here we go. Oh, and whenever we have people listen to audio, when we're in a Zoom or when we're in person, we often like to say, um, don't feel like you have to look at people or make eye contact in the, you know, other people in the Zoom. You can close your eyes, you can sit back and listen. It's about three minutes long. So, um, you know, we're not expecting you to do anything in particular while this audio only piece is happening. When we hear the same stories about history over and over again, they can feel like the only truth or seem like they're the whole truth. One story that's being told a lot, especially in 2020, is about the suffrage movement, the fight for women's right to vote in America. The most common version of that history goes something like this. Before the 1840s, American women did not have the right to vote. So a few bold white ladies started a movement to change that. The story tells us that they led the charge until they achieved victory in 1920, when the 19th Amendment was ratified. From then on, we're told, all women in this country could vote. I'm Laura Free, and this is Amended, a podcast from Humanities New York. Like a lot of white people, I grew up hearing that version of the story. But the problem with that story is, it makes white women the only important suffrage activists. And it makes us think they secured voting rights for all women. 
We find ourselves in a dilemma now in 2020. How do you tell that story and that history? My guests on the show are fellow historians and scholars who will tell us how diverse and complex women's rights history really was. This has got to be the largest personal archive I have ever seen. It is, and it's the largest one on black women, too. There have always been black suffragists, as long as there have been suffragists. We don't want to write people out who were actually there. We'll hear stories of some historic power plays and some epic betrayals that help us understand why voting rights are still profoundly threatened today. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. You white women speak here of rights. I speak of wrongs. Sex was never the only battleground for equal voting rights. So Amended will center the stories of women who also fought oppression based on race, citizenship status, and class. We see them everywhere. And we see them speaking out. They're all making records and speaking powerfully to what women's rights is supposed to do. People of color as a whole, whether you're talking about male or female, they still are being stripped of their natural right, the right to vote as citizens of the United States of America. Hit subscribe and join us as we trace a broader fight for women's full equality from the 1800s to the present day. Starting August 26th, we'll be talking about what's been gained, what's been lost, and what's still left to be done. Awesome. Thank you, Reva. That was so cool. Uh, I, st I still get chills when I hear some of, some of that. Uh, it's just really exciting that you were able to get in touch with so many cool folks and, and help build such a neat story. So let's talk about Amended. What is the significance of that name? Well, so uh, Humanities New York knew that, along with everyone else, that the 19th Amendment was having an anniversary, a 100th anniversary in 2020. And so they set out to find a way to recognize that without celebrating it, right? Just to sort of let's engage, engage with this. Um, so amended refers, of course, to the 19th Amendment, which said um, you can't deny the right to vote on the basis of sex. But it's also a, a notion of what we're trying to do here. We're trying to amend the history. Um, to sort of say what's been done before is, is a good foundation, but it's not enough. Um, and um, there's lots of work out there that is being done to broaden the story, and that, that needs a spotlight. So it's kind of, a, I guess, a double meaning, the amendment and amending, um, and, and you know, sort of thinking about the present, what still needs to be amended. So the, the first episode features the Seneca Falls Women's Rights Convention and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Why did you decide to start the story there? That's a good question. Well, what, you know, part of it is because, you know, I live here, <laughs> right? So it's, I, we're, it's very close. It's nearby. My scholarship has been um, focused on the racism exhibited by Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony. And so for me personally, it was important to begin there because that's where my work begins, but also that's a point that a lot of people know, right? People know Susan B. Anthony. If they know nothing else about the women's suffrage movement, they know Susan B. Anthony. And so um, even though she wasn't at the Seneca Falls Convention, um, sometimes people know about the Seneca Falls Convention, but it, 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 it is typically in our imagined narrative of the American suffrage movement, the beginning point. Um, and so it was important to sort of grapple with why is that the beginning point? Why not recognize the other moments where women were engaging in activist work and demanding their rights in um, the 18th and 19th centuries? Why that moment? And then I think it was important too to sort of say, okay, just everyone from here on out, this isn't going to be who the story is about, right? We're going to tell you a little bit about this and we're going to start with a moment that you think you might know, but we're going to broaden the lens. Um, I really liked how how we sort of, among us, we were when we talked about it, we said we wanted to pivot away from the podium at the Seneca Falls Convention and pivot out to the audience. Who, who else was there? What else are they doing? Um, what kinds of activist work are they doing? To sort, just sort of use what where most people begin and and go branch out from there. But also it was here. <laughs> it's always nice to start close to home. 
So when you're talking about that lens and, and shifting the lens, you know, sort of away from the podium and into the crowd. And um, so how, how did you decide who among that crowd, who to feature? You know, how did you decide where you did want to point your lens, so to speak? Yeah, I've been talking a lot, Reva. Do you want to, do you want to say something? Sure. Um, well, I think one of our approaches was to kind of, you know, to look not at who, who was who gained rights at some of these important milestones that we talk about, but who was still excluded at that point and why were they excluded? So, um, for example, in the second episode, um, we talk about women who were enslaved at the moment, black, black women who were enslaved at the moment when that convention took place. And maybe they couldn't, they of course couldn't travel to be at a convention about women's rights, but they were certainly doing active things all the time to advance their liberty and advance equality. Um, and so we, we wanted to look at sort of, okay, this is what was gained, but then who and why was left out. So that also led us to look at um, Im different groups of immigrants who were excluded later on in the season. We look at the Chinese Exclusion Act and why um, the 19, that moment of 1920 and the 19th Amendment did not enfranchise women who had immigrated from China. So um, that was sort of just in terms of, you know, choosing what types of stories to tell. And then it was a very painful decision to decide which women within, you know, those huge um, categories uh, of activists to include because there were so many and focusing on just one was really painful. So yeah, that was always a decision we made pretty painstakingly, but luckily, um, you know, Laura's great background with history and, and research and, you know, it was, um, it, it helped us to figure out, okay, who do we really need to be talking to about this and, and how can we choose someone that by far isn't the only person to talk about this or to the only story to portray this, but that will open it up in a way that allows us to cover a lot of the ground that we want to cover. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that it's important to include all these different perspectives on history? You know, a, a lot of folks will say, well, history is learning the facts of the past. Yeah, my, my friends and I, who, who are historians, always joke that if we ever had to go on Jeopardy, we'd be like a national embarrassment. Like, sure, there's facts, but uh, we really don't spend our time in that space. What, what historians do and what history is really about is um, are, are the stories, but also the whys and the how and, you know, what happened and why we want to, we want to get at that why question. Um, and I think it's so important um, when you're thinking about something that happened to recognize that there are so many stories about why and what happened. It's not just, um, you know, a recitation of names and dates. It's um, the rich complexity of the human experience. Um, I think historians are, are trying to grapple with that and to do that right and to do that well means you can't ignore any any groups of people um, at any point because, you know, it, that's just bad history. Yeah. And did you, because you were looking at some of the non-dominant narratives, did you struggle with a paucity of material? I mean, you, you talk to uh, Betty Collier Thomas and, and she was talking about having the largest repository of history of about black women, the primary sources and those sorts of things. Did you struggle with that in the production of, of this series? Um, occasionally, um, yes. I, I, I have to tell a story about Betty and, and her archive because it was just so incredible. You, you know, she, we, she invited us into her home. This was pre-pandemic, so part of, part of the production was pre-pandemic and part of it was post. And so we got to go to Betty's house and she invited us over and, and she showed us her, her archive and it took up the whole sort of lower level of her home. And um, we kept rounding corners and there was just more and more and more. And every full, every file cabinet had, you know, acres of articles and records and documents. And then she had miles of microfilm. I mean, it was, it was astonishing. Um, and later on, I was talking to Martha Jones, who's the historian in our second episode and she was like, do you know how much I would give to get into Betty's personal archive? <laughs> like we all, every historian of black women in America wants in to Betty's archive. So I felt really, really honored that she shared that with us and that she showed us that. Um, you know, where, where it became tricky is um, some of the people that we um, looked at did not leave written records of their lives, um, but they left records. And so the, the episode two is where we see that the most talking about it 
women. Um, one of the three women we talk about wrote her story, Harriet Jacobs, after she self-emancipated, but um, others did not have um, written records in, from their own perspective. And so that was something that um, that Martha talked to us a lot about, about how do you do history when people don't leave written records? And you do it by um, looking at their actions. You do it by um, reading into the sources that are there. So, um, you know, the story about Charity Castle, who was enslaved by um, a, a white family in um, outside of Baltimore, um, they left lots of personal records about themselves talking about charity. And so Martha talked to us about how you read into that to get at charity story without adopting the perspective of the enslaved. So that was really, really powerful and important, I think. It was a very powerful episode that changed a lot of things that I was thinking about. Um, so you have a, a series of six, right? The, that are, are, and then, then you're sadly done. Uh, why did you choose a podcast? What about that medium as opposed to, a, you know, video or, or um, a, a, a classroom experience? Why did you choose that? Well, well Laura, Laura didn't choose a podcast. The podcast chose her, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Humanities New York, which is the, um, the organization out of New York State that, um, that conceived of this project in the first place, um, I, when I went to start talking to them about how do you make a podcast? What's the budget? How do we do this? They um, had a very clear idea that they wanted their board member, Laura, free to be the host and that she would be excellent. And so, you know, luckily she agreed to do it. I think not knowing exactly how much work it would be, um, definitely not knowing how much work it would be. Um, but, um, you know, so we were both brought on to kind of bring to life the vision that this organization had. But over the course of it, I think Laura and I both really realized that um, doing history in podcast in a podcast was both really difficult, but it was also a really excellent way to do it because it's so intimate. It's literally in, you're literally listening to it inside your brain. And so if you want to open people's thinking about something, what better way to do it than to literally be inside their heads? Um, so, you know, that was something and the intimacy of, of the medium too, who really allowed us to think about, um, you know, what are the ways we can tell the story that will immerse our listener in, in the past that we want them to visit? So I think it really um, was a really perfect medium, but definitely challenging in how much we had to narrow what we could say in order to do audio storytelling that was, that was sort of um, limited enough to not be overwhelming and so that someone could follow it if they were jogging and listening or doing the dishes and listening at the same time. So we thought about all those things. Wow. So if you're committed to talking about the past, you don't have the original soundscape. You know, you don't have the sound of somebody churning butter. You don't have the sound of, of you know, the Lowell factories and, and the, the knitting mills and things like that. How did you, how did you accomplish that immersion from an audio perspective? How can I tell this story? It's a, I love it. it. It's so fun to do this. Like I had no idea what I was getting into. Honestly, I really thought I was like, oh, I'll just spend a little few hours here and there. No, we we would write thirty page scripts for every episode that then get cut way down. We would spend hours and hours recording, then hours and hours, um, you know, trimming, and and then and that doesn't even count touch the work that Reba does. But what Reba does is she's such a genius at soundscaping. Like we'd be, so my favorite story is when we were interviewing Judy Wellman in um, in Seneca Falls at the at the park and um, we'd be walking around and then Reba would go, shh, 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 you know, hold on. And she'd hold up her microphone and like, I gotta get that sound because maybe that sound's gonna be important. She, I th how many times did I go in and out of the door at the, at the chapel there? Like many, so she could get the right exact sound of that. But it was really great. We were um, around the corner from um, from the park at the home of, oh, I'm blanking on his name, help me out. Um, oh my God, I'm blanking too, James. There's a, James. There's a lot of names. The, anyway, the, a family, it will come okay. to us, hopefully. Okay. We've been, by the way, we've been writing a script all day, so we're both a little bit fried. So please forgive us for that. Yeah, I taught my last class yesterday and then spent all day today writing the next script. So sorry, yeah, sorry. Um, Thomas the, James, got it, Thomas James. 
definitely. Yes. Thomas James was um, a, a black uh, barber in the town who then went on to become a very wealthy and prominent citizen. And so we were standing in front of his house around the corner from the park. And I was asking Judy questions about the James family. And um, Judy is the premier historian of, of the Seneca Falls moment. And um, so she was telling us all these great stories. And the, a church across the way started to play their, their, their bells. And so I was kind of like, oh, like, oh, we have to stop recording. And Reba was like, oh, and, and she's like, she got so excited and, and she recorded the sound and that sound then appeared in later in our conversation, but even more profoundly, the song they were playing, Let Us Break Bread Together, um, became kind of an uber theme underneath um, a lot of the episodes, especially in the first half. So um, it, it that was kind of fortuitous. It was I thought it was an interruption and Reva saw it as, as the rich um, opportunity that it really, really was. So did you guys get to go on site for a while before COVID hit? Yeah. And then how did the production process change? Yeah. <laughs> it changed a lot. Um, but, you know, I, I think we drew upon whenever, whenever you're interviewing someone, it's just talking no matter where you are. So you always have to think about what are going to be the things that make this more than just a conversation where we're actually getting stories and images and things like that. So we thought a lot about you know, when we would talk to people, we would make sure that we that they had a very personal connection to the material they were going to talk about. So um, when we did a story about labor activism for episode four, we were talking to um, Dr. Annalise Orlick. Um, we we happened to know because we had read her book that a lot of her interest in the subject matter came from her own grandmother's experience. Her grandmother had worked in the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory, and we were doing a story about um, about that event and the activism surrounding it. So we asked her right away, um, can you talk about how you first heard the story? And she talked about seeing her grandmother uh, and her relationship with her grandmother. And so we, we would always try to find what's the personal hook that we're gonna use for this, for this episode where, where the listener is actually gonna feel like they're on an emotional journey with the, with the people that they're, they're hearing from. We also use some sound design. I have some sneaky you know, sound libraries that are free you know, I can go find the sound of a car backing up to find, you know, or I could find, I found we needed to do sort of a walking in New York in the 1800s scene. And so I couldn't just go outside and record New York City noise where I live in New York City. So I found some, you know, background sound from a quiet park and I found some pigeon wings flapping and kind of, you know, constructed a scene out of sound. So we, we had to, we had to do it completely differently in every episode um, and just find some kernel of an idea that would inspire us to figure out, you know, how does how does this one come to life? How does this one come to life? And then luckily we eventually got into the period where we had some archival tape that we could start to draw from. Um, but that, you know, the early stories, there was no no chance of that. So one of the things that was really funny was when we started this, I, I recorded my narration at WEOS on the on the HWS campus, um, but then the pandemic hit, so I couldn't record narration there anymore. So I wound up recording in my closet. So I have this cardboard box that's aligned with acoustic tile kind of tiles, and then I stick the microphone in the box, and then I set set it on a shelf in my closet, and I'm surrounded by my clothes, and I'm leaning in to the to the box so that you know there's not background sound, and then my kid slams the door, and we. Have have to start over so you know like the 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 locations shifted a little bit but um the process was 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 very much always the same yeah and for me the longest part of my of the process is sitting at my desk writing and editing so that part was very very much the same so, so as you're as you're kind of getting to the end of this process what were your goals for the project when you started and, and did they change over time? I think we we just wanted to do good history. You know, we wanted to um, share stories that maybe people didn't know or hadn't encountered before. We wanted to give voice to people who perhaps had, did not have uh, an opportunity to share their stories when they were alive or um, whose stories have gone overlooked since. Um, and to give the space for historians to um, share their stories. You know, you'd asked earlier about why a podcast and, you know, it wasn't something that I had ever thought about or planned on doing, but, um, you know, we had 30,000 downloads. I don't reach 30,000 people in, in a semester of teaching. You know, I adore my students and that's incredible, but the, the reach of that is, is, is really a 
um, you know, I, I, I had no idea it would take off so, so well, but my, my goal was just to do good history. Yeah. What about you, Reva? Did you, did you um, accomplish what you wanted to with this project? I think so. I mean, I think I didn't really know what I was getting into because I, I think I was very much like a lot of the listeners of the show, which is when we started this process, um, I had a very sort of, you know, I had sort of an idea in my head of what the suffrage movement was, who the suffragists were, and they were black and white photos of white women in white dresses marching with signs. Um, and so in a way that was difficult because I had so much to learn, but in a way it, it did allow me to, you know, ask Laura some really dumb questions and just make sure that the listener with sort of the lowest knowledge possible about the issue could understand. And that if there was something we needed to stop and explain better, we could do that. So I had no idea how much I was going to learn. I thought we were going to tell a story that I thought I sort of knew the outline of. And we, you know, in the very first episode from the beginning, we, we totally pulled that apart. Um, and yeah, and it, 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 I definitely, I'm ending up in an entirely different place than when I started. So yeah, I had no idea where we were going, but, but I, I love everything that I learned and I'm gonna, and I tell everybody about it all. Every episode that we're working on is like the only thing I can talk about. So pe I think people in my life will be <laughs> relieved when it's over, but. <laughs> there's there, there's no faith as powerful as that of a convert is that, is that how it goes yeah, yeah i think you know yes, we, we spend yes. a lot of time in, well you know you you i was gonna say that i always think i become an expert on something when i hear a podcast about it and then start you know oh i heard on you know hidden brain that this is how your brain works but when it's your own podcast and you're actually doing all the research then you can really play the expert so yeah One of the things that we grapple with a lot at women's rights is is that we are we are home to this narrative to this you know very traditional narrative that is is very exclusionary and and we have had to really branch out in order you know to to do our due diligence and fulfill our responsibility to preserve that story but also to address it in in a context that's that's relevant and honest and and with integrity to make sure that we include um, different perspectives as well and and one of the one of, you, you know you mentioned the um the episode about the the with with the triangle shirtwaist fire and, and that was a, a big discovery moment for me looking at how um how gendered the labor movement was uh, looking at how women uh, participated in that and how domestic life influence you know so many different features of these political movements um you know it's something that a lot of folks are not prepared for when they're on vacation um it's, and so you talked about you know having to make sure that people can listen while they're while they're jogging while they're doing the dishes and and i completely sympathize with that about, about how important it is to make sure that we're at, um we're, we're maintaining that integrity and, and also telling a compelling story. So um, I, I appreciate, I'm gonna steal all kinds of good stuff from you guys. So I'm really excited about it. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, we talked a little bit before about, um, you know, that you, you haven't, because of the nature of the podcast, you haven't really been able to get a ton of feedback um, except the sort of anecdotal stuff. You, you did get 30,000 downloads, that's fantastic. And, and um, the, the digital world has opened us up a little bit. Uh, when you look at what you what you didn't quite get to do, do you know what you would do for like amended part two? What would what would be the the, the topics that you'd like to look at in, in another series like this? Well, one thing that just, we just didn't have space for was telling a story of, of a Latinx woman, and um, I think that um, would have been really really great to get get to get to do. That would be number one on my list of, of the next stories to tell. Um, yeah. And you know, I think we also um, had by 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 uh, just because of the limitations, we didn't get um, to sort of carry the story really through into the 20th century, past you know into the 1960s and sort of voting rights movements um, of that time, the the Voting Rights Act, you know, all of all of that. Um, I think that would have been really great to get to dig into a little bit more than we were able to as well. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> How about you, Reva? Anything that you would um, you'd like to either do differently or be able to also do? 
Um, I really thought that almost all of our guests that we had on each episode should have their own podcast because they, um, they go so deep into their work and it's so interesting and they have so much to say that, that, that hasn't had sort of the dramatic treatment, the narrative treatment that, that some of these stories have had. And I, I think that um, I would love to document some of the new stories that are, you know, they're about the past, but they're being in, uncovered now because, you know, more newspapers are being scanned and digital and searchable or like, you know, they're, they're more sort of um, stories that are coming out and that process of making new history uh, is really interesting to me. And I would love to um, find a way to tell a story about history, but that is sort of brand new, you know, something that nobody knows yet because it's just being discovered and you're, you're with that person who's making that discovery and putting together all the pieces to see what they mean, so. I would enjoy that. That's a really empowering process. That's one of the things that I, I think is really great about public history is that it gives us an opportunity to use the stories of the past to empower people in the present. And, and um, one of the things that, that Laura said in, in her presentation, I asked a, a very tricky question, which is, you know, when, when we start talking about this dominant narrative and we start picking it apart, you know, are we allowed to have heroes anymore? Are, are we allowed to, to still look up to people that we looked up to before? And, and Laura, your answer to that question is, has been a, um, a really important part of, of my work at the park. Um, do you remember what you said? <laughs> I, I mean, I, I have sort of a <laughs> notion of what I might have said, but I'd love to hear, I'd love to hear it uh, closer to what you heard. <laughs> Um, I, I imagine you get that question a lot, but you said, you know, that yes, that you've said already today, all those stories are important, but that, that when we start looking at, at our, um, our icons and history as real people, it allows us to accomplish great things within our own humanity, that we don't have to be perfect in order to do good. Um, and that was, that was just a really um, a great idea for me and, and it help, has helped me grapple with a lot of the things that you guys uncovered and, and helped me grapple with uh, how to tell this story in, in a way that a modern audience can can identify with it you know to I, I love to tell about the the tea party that 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 we we talk about is the seminal moment um, for the Seneca Falls Convention because it's 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 what we're doing right now it's a, a group of people sitting around you know uh, we would we would be doing it it together if we, in, a, in a conference room or something if we weren't on zoom talking about things that are important and and something that we do every day could could become something that, that changes society you know that, that people everyday fallible humans are empowered to do that so that was really uh, i appreciate that so I'm glad i got a chance to, to thank you for it Thanks. Yeah. You know, I think when we um, mythologize people in the past and like put them on a pedestal and imagine that they were perfect humans, um, then it, it disempowers us because God knows I'm not perfect. So why, why would I bother to try to do anything? Because I'm not, you know, as amazing as this person in the past, but if we sort of recognize, Hey, they were people, they had, they made mistakes. They had opinions we, we disagree with. They said some horrible things. They also said some interesting, amazing, important things. Like let's, let's take the whole of that. Um, and then that then can empower us to um, make change as well. And if we, if we give ourselves more than just a few women, famous women to admire, you know, there are so, there's so little real estate for, for women, our women history heroes. And, you know, the more we understand that there's so many women, the less each one needs to have done it all, you know, no, Susan B. Anthony didn't give all American women the right to vote. She just didn't. Um, it took a lot of other women. She actually didn't want to work with some women, you know, that, that could have used her help at the time who were trying to be included in the American democracy. So, uh, but that doesn't mean that she didn't do something incredible that, you know, we live with the results of it today. So I think part of it is the, is the limited, the limited space. And that was sort of something we had to grapple with from the beginning. It's like, we're saying, we're telling you that the history you barely heard because women's history gets this much space. We're telling you that don't believe that it's that, you know, so we, we struggle with the fact that it gets such little space to begin with. And we don't want to, you know, just take away somebody's hero or, um, you know, it's just not that simple. It's just nowhere near that simple. So I, I hope people can sort of come away with more of an understanding of 
you know, this important person did these things. And at the very same moment, there was some other stuff going on that had nothing to do with them. So yeah, it's a different way to think about it. We, we did have um, a question come in through the chat and I wanted to ask you, this is uh, specifically about, about um, working with college students. So uh, in what ways, if any, did, did you guys connect with the students in any of your classes, Laura, or, or you know, women's studies majors and, and students at William Smith as part of this process? How, how did you, if at all, um, bring them into these revelations? Well, one of the things that um, working on a podcast has made me do is sort of rethink um, the role of source material for, for my classes. So um, like the, this semester, I taught a history of women's suffrage course and um, not history of women's suffrage, just women's history. And um, I uh, invited my students to listen to the amended episodes where they appeared. We did a unit on the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire. So I, I put this in as a possible thing, as a resource for them. Um, I'm reluctant and in fact would never assign my own stuff as a requirement, <laughs> um, but uh, this, it fit really well. Um, in my Civil War, class last semester I used um, the I used the podcast uncivil a lot as a, as a source as a set of source materials so um, students I think really resonate with podcasts it's a, it's a it's a genre they're they're familiar with they already listen to podcasts they like and it's a, I think a, a really great way to engage them and to um, think about oral you know oral learning um, the other thing that I've been thinking about a lot is um, teaching a class on history podcasting like this is how you do it this is what you the process looks like let's all make a podcast together um, and and that's something I, I will definitely do in the future but I couldn't do that while I was also doing a podcast I, I like you know sort of limited resources but um, yeah I think I think it's a, it's a fantastic and really accessible way of um, sharing information and that th I think that will be um, really important for students to engage with in the future. That's a good great, great question. Thank you. We have a, another question. Um, are there is there going to be any are there any written works coming out of the podcast? So any traditional media that will um, be a companion to this? Well, we do have um, uh, on the website, there's a transcript, a detailed transcript for every episode, and then we have links and further reading and things like that. So um, Humanities New York has done a good job of trying to gather some other resources for people who want to look further. Uh, so you can always go to humanitiesny.org, and there's a page for each of the episodes there. Yeah, but in terms of like you know creating a book out of this, and so there's the. What was that? Oh, I just said in, in terms of like, you know, will there be a book that comes out, an amended book? I don't think so. This is, this is, it is an odd, it is an audio, um, an audio. Um, so you can get to it from the Humanities New York website. Uh, it's also on, what are some of the other ways that people can, um, can hear your episodes? It's on Apple Podcasts, it's on Spotify, it's on Stitcher, it's on all of the sort of, you know, uh, apps and websites. So uh, almost all of them. I think there might be a couple that, that it's not on, but all the major ones. Yeah. But plenty of people listen just in their browser on their computer, and that's, that's a totally legit way to listen to it, too. I like to read along, too. I have to admit and it looks like um, Teresa is is putting some of those links in the chat if somebody would like to follow them. Um, it has the Humanities New York and Stitcher, and you can also, like I said, like Ruba said, follow each of those to the um, to their own individual page for the transcripts. Yeah, and the episodes are embedded in those pages too. So if you go to the page on Humanities New York, you can listen along with the episode, and the transcript is right there, underneath it. Reba, what was your favorite moment? You mean in the production process or in the finished? Yeah, when making the show, what was your best, what was your favorite moment? Um, 
That's a really great question. Um, definitely loved going down in Betty Collier's archive, but I think um, we, Laura and I um, went to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania to meet a woman named Sharia Ben, who's not a historian, but she's act actually a living history performer. And she did the voice of Frances Ellen Watkins Harper for us, um, but she was just a really good sport. And Laura, um, Laura and I had some documents of some of the important meetings that she was at that Sharia hadn't seen before. And sitting there recording as Laura and Sharia sort of discovered these scenes together and Sharia for the first time had an even deeper understanding of this woman who she'd been studying for really a decade, who had, she'd written a play about Frances Ellen Watkins Harper. She'd performed as her, um, but seeing her sort of continue to discover and actually learn something um, from the production process was, and then, you know, Laura and Sharia had a really wonderful moment that we captured on tape when they just sort of processed, what does this mean to, to have on, so they were basically reading about a moment where Frances Ellen Watkins Harper said to Susan B. Anthony, um, you know, you need to include Black women in your, in your advocacy for equality. And, Susan, you know, Susan B. Anthony basically says no. And it was, they, they just sort of processed that together and it was a really powerful moment to, to be a fly on the wall and capture. How about you, Laura? Um, yeah, that was an amazing moment. That was a really, really powerful and important moment. And, um, and, you know, we went on to have a, a really deep and meaningful conversation about race in America contemporarily. And, and that was also really, um, transformative for me. So definitely. Um, another highlight was um, when we went to the Homewood Museum with, with Dr. Martha Jones, which was um, an enslaver's home, and she walked us through the spaces and talked to us about, um, about the people who lived there um, and who were enslaved there. And she walked us into um, one of the bedrooms that would have been the bedroom of the female enslaver in the family and um, talked to us about the sexual violence that sh that she herself experienced and that the enslaved women in that family would have experienced and it, it being in the space and hearing the story and um it, it was it was really profound and um I, I i i get the chills whenever i think about it and um that was really really a powerful moment as well yeah, if you were yeah there i think maybe sorry i totally interrupted you laura go ahead I say fewer of those in the Zoom in the Zoom environment, but um, yeah. Sorry, Reva, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say I think that the the moments that seemed to mean the most to both of us were the ones where, you know, we were actually seeing we're talking about history, but something was happening in the moment between, you know, us and the people we were recording with. You know, some someone was feeling real feelings that were tied to the to something that had happened in the past. And those moments felt really powerful because it wasn't like we were just, you know, telling something that had happened. We were also really grappling with the very real sort of, you know, long tail of, of how everyone impacted is impacted today by those things that happened in the past. We have another question. Yeah, and that, that comes through very clearly. I mean, I think that's a testimony of. of mm -hmm. Yeah, um, we've got two more questions. Uh, is there a target age group for the podcast? So um, uh, Carol says she can't wait to listen, but so far uh, she hasn't listened to nearly as many podcasts as her 30 something children. So who do you think you're reaching out there? Well, you know, I, I, I think um, podcasts are for everyone. Um, I think every everyone should be able to and, and, and appreciate and enjoy a podcast. There are so many different podcasts, too. I used to listen to one that reviewed woodcase pencils. <laughs> so, you know, you can find your own niche podcast, no matter what your age is. I think actually podcasts, um, my, my older family members really like them because they, it, they're reminded of radio. Of, of traditional radio narratives and radio stories, um, things that they would have heard when they're young, um, but that have um, you know sort of faded away these days. And so I think it revives that in, in a way. Um, I guess I, I would say some of our episodes, maybe you would want to screen before you played for a young child, um, particularly the second episode, because it talks a lot about sexual violence. But um, other than that, I think um, I, 
their podcast is a, is a, is a, is a very open genre for many, many people. Is that what you would, do you agree, Reva? Is that what you would say too? I do. Yeah. I mean, I think when, when we were making it, we would try to get ourselves to imagine a specific young person who was, you know, maybe a first year student of history in college, maybe a freshman in college who was very eager, but knew very little. And so we would sort of picture that person and try to aim it um, at that person. And then build on that as we went along. So, you know, allow things to become a little more complicated and talk about things that you had to have learned in a previous episode and sort of build up on that knowledge. But that was sort of, you know, whenever we would try to keep ourselves, um, you know, accessible, that was sort of the, what we aimed it for. Yeah, I think you originally said something like, let's, you know, let's think about um, a high school student. I was like, I don't know high school students, but first year college students, I know them. <laughs> <laughs> let's talk to them. And so uh, that's where, that's where I yeah. would do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I could identify very much with that person because I apparently took very, either took very little history or just remember very little of it. So <laughs> We could just pretend it was talking to me most of the time. So what kind of feedback did you get for reframing this part of our history? Um, um, you know, we haven't, we haven't had much of an opportunity to, to hear about that, but I know that in her work, Laura, you know, is often the person going into a room and saying, you know, I'm going to tell you about a moment when Elizabeth Cady Stanton was racist. So she, she does get reactions, right? You deal with, or even have an ancestor of a person you're talking about in the, in the room when you're giving a talk. So. Yeah, that happened at the park. <laughs> I was at, at the Seneca Falls Women's Rights Park and I was giving a talk about how, the racism of Elizabeth Cady Stanton and her descendant was sitting in the audience. Um, that was a little awkward. Uh, I had been told that she was going to be there, but I do not remember being told that she was going to be there. And so I um, had sort of this moment where I was like, do I do I adjust what I'm going to say here? Um, do I do I try to sort of soften the blow? And um, and I, you know, my, it was kind of a, a, that was the coward's way out. And I didn't take it. I, I was like, OK, I'm, go I'm going for it. I'm just I this is this is the history. Um, I'm not making anything these are things that she said. This is what she said in print. It's profoundly racist. Let's talk about it and engage with that because if we ignore it, um, that perpetuates racism and inequity, and we can't. We can't ignore it. So um, it was. Uh, it was. It was a, a bit of an uncomfortable moment. That was. Yeah. Um, I forget what the original. Yeah. But I think for the most part, we've we've heard sort of you know people telling us that that they were they appreciated what they learned and i i think something we we didn't want anyone to feel called out we wanted everyone to feel called in and so you know we didn't want to um you know make anyone feel like what they knew was bad or wrong but we just wanted to invite them to to contemplate some some different versions of the story and i think i hope that was some you know effective for people at least the people we've heard from have seemed appreciative to have um, to have had their perspectives changed. Maybe the people who didn't appreciate it so much didn't feel like talking to us or reviewing our show on Apple Podcasts, but yeah. I, I got a direct, I got a question. What is the most important event in women's history? Oh, I have no idea. <laughs> I, I, I would have no idea. I would have no even, I wouldn't even know where to begin to answer that question because there are so many. And also um, I think that uh, one of the things I've I've learned in doing this podcast is that it isn't always the events that are important. It's the small moments. It's the moment where Celia stands up for herself and murders her master because she doesn't want to be sexually assaulted anymore. That's that's a powerful and important moment where Frances Harper calls out Susan B. Anthony in public and says, "You are leaving out black women," um, and that's that's an important event right um, I think uh, I think if we focus too much on on the the big things then we lose the power and the significance of individual people standing up for what they believed and um, there is nothing that will make change other than for what they believe that, that would be my uh, 
my answer. One of the other questions that came in was, um, you know, how do these stories affect education in our modern times? Well, one of the things I think that we've got, we've got this sort of dominant narrative. Sorry, Zoom lag. Sorry about that. Um, one oh, of the internet I, troubles. Yeah, Zoom lag. Can you hear me now? Am I, okay, sorry. sorry yeah. everyone. I was going to say one of the things that I think has been really amazing about, um, you know, the field of women's history is very new. It's um, it, it's only been since the 1960s that um, professional historians have thought women worth investigating at all. And so um, one of the things that I think has been really amazing about um, the project of history and of women's history in particular is getting these stories into um, into the classroom and um, l helping students to learn that history is more than big events and more than you know wars and um, you know not that those aren't important of course they are but that there's there's a lot more to it and that I think is um, has been something that I uh, I know so many historians have been working on doing. You're muted. Ronnie Frischman wants to know, what was the biggest myth that you uncovered in your detective work? You want that one, Reva, or you want me to? I don't know that we were uncovering, uh, well, I, I don't know that we, that, our, that we were uncovering myths. I think we were more sort of, uh, sort of taking narratives, taking familiar narratives apart and trying to reframe them. So, I mean, I think the, maybe the most obvious, biggest thing we wanted to communicate was that 1920, you know, the 19th Amendment was not the end of the fight for equality, you know, for women's equal voting rights because so many uh, people were still excluded at that moment um, because of their race, because of their citizenship status for, for many other reasons. So. Um, that was, I think, what we were sort of up against as the, as the number one thing we wanted people to not think of 1920 um, as the end, but to think of it as a point along a continuum of many moments that need, you know, continuous advocacy and then continuous sort of vigilance to make sure to, to keep not to lose ground when there's been a gain um, on behalf of, of equal voting rights. So. Um, yeah, not to look at it as something that's that's ever really finished, but that needs to that was fought for for a long time and that we continue to fight for now. How do you do, Laura? <laughs> you said, yeah, <laughs> that was good. <laughs> Definitely. Has this project galvanized you in any ways to to change the way that you conduct your own activism and your own lives? Definitely. Yeah. I mean, I think it's going to make me more patient. Oh, sorry, Laura. Go ahead. Okay. The, the lag has gotten really bad. I'm so sorry I'm talking over you. Um, I was just going to say, I, I think it's, made me, it's going to make me a lot more patient just to see how long things take. Um, and how many of the women we looked at had such a, were taking such a longer term vision. They weren't thinking of like, what could we achieve right now? You know, if we just focus on white women, maybe we can get something done, you know, but we we're looking at the people who, who were thinking of a, of a, of a more total equality that, that didn't exclude anyone. Um, and, and that was just such a long term project and it still is a long term project. And you know, in thinking about my own activism, I want to focus on those long term projects that maybe, you know, maybe the results won't be as immediately clear. But then when you look back in history, you can see that it was the accumulation um, of all of those things that that sort of converged into more of a movement. Um, and we can't be impatient and we can't always be, you know, politically expeditious or whatever the word is. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's not the right fight. That doesn't mean we should give up. Um, you know, what we believe is, is the ultimate goal and the ultimate vision. So yeah, it has absolutely changed how I, how I think about activism on any issue, not just, not just voting rights. Climate, also a long-term fight.
I, I guess I tend to think about um, my, I feel my professional work is at the core of my activism, right? Um, my, my work as a historian uncovering and, and um, expanding his, our, our, our sense of what is history and what, um, whose, stories are, whose stories are valued. Um, that, that feels to me very much at the heart of my activism. And so um, for me, Amended was a project of activism. Thank you so much. Um, we're just about done. If anybody has any other questions, you can feel free to um, add your add them in the chat and add your email and, and um, I'll be around and, and Laura's available. Reva, I'm sure if we have any more questions, you guys will be happy to, to chip in there and um, yeah. want to thank everyone for joining us for taking the time uh, really I'm very grateful to Teresa for putting this together it was really fun to talk to both of you so thank you thank you so much and uh, feel free for everybody having us buddy come by and see me in Seneca Falls the next time you can do that we're open on Tuesdays and Thursdays so um, we'd love to chat some more Teresa, do you have anything else that you want to share with folks before they go? Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you to the three of you for helping to put this all together. Um, I And I feel like with so many of these programs, uh, we scratch the surface of things like women's rights and how we are, are learning about them in the classroom. And then, but also having Reva here to talk about the whole background of putting together this podcast. So it really accomplished those two facets, but I feel like we need to have a few more sessions. <laughs> but I just appreciate the time that you put into, into this um, and planning it and everybody on the call tonight, thank you. Um, these are important issues. Um, and again, just having that whole production side and weaving that into all of this just, just made it a perfect program. So thank you from the Office of Alumni and Alumni Relations. We really appreciate it. And everybody have a great night. Thank you for joining us. Before you before you log off, because I, I have to say, I did listen, I listened to this podcast series when we first asked um, Laura, and I'm, I'm a fan of radio and oral traditions and oral storytelling. And if you have not had a chance to tune in, please do so. But I really, really appreciated the way you were able to share those silent voices, to tell those untold stories. And for a black person like me, as an immigrant coming into this country, learning that there were also black heroes that might have been silenced that did a lot of this work, right? So when I when I write where that I would have been a suffragette T-shirt, yes, that may be knowing that there were suffragettes that looked like me, but they weren't necessarily getting their stories. So I just want to thank you, thank you, thanks. So Carol is is, is <laughs> clapping up there, but um, amazing, amazing, and if. I hope there will be more episodes, more stories told, or another project <laughs> through Humanities New York that will will we'll put you um, once again on our radar. But thank you again. I, so from the bottom of my heart. <laughs>